Okay, we have finished Daniel. Now we're back into Revelation. And we're going to start off with uh, chapter 6, uh, which is the opening of the six seals. So, I think before we even get started, we need to step back a little and just look at some of the bigger picture uh, items of Revelation itself. First and foremost, what is the structure of Revelation? Because that's quite important. Uh, and there are several different structures to consider. One is there's a chronological structure to Revelation. And what I mean by that is that chronological, the story is told in a linear time frame, okay? So we would start off with the first seal. After the first seal comes the second seal, and then the third seal, and then the fourth seal. We could say the same thing for the trumpets. After the first comes the second, comes the third. We could say the same thing for the bowls. However, are all the seals then followed by all the trumpets, followed by all the bowls? That is something that also has to, to be uh, considered. Uh, they could be staggered. So in other words, you could have uh, the seals and the trumpets and some of them could overlap or there, you could have some simultaneous. It's all things that has to be considered. But then something that's even more important probably are the parenthetical chapters. Parentheticals are timeouts. So in other words, a lot's being revealed to the Apostle John. And it's just more than probably the mind can absorb. And, and you need time. He needs time to kind of like stop and collect his thoughts. Well, more importantly, uh, you probably have Jesus or the angel going, um, John, I think let's, let's do a timeout. And then let's go back and review some things. Um, and so these timeouts are very important because they help explain, expand, refresh the memory, to reiterate, to give background, to give historical information on why what's happening is happening. Uh, a good example of a parenthetical would be Revelation 12 that goes into the woman and the dragon. And, and so uh, this is something else that needs to be considered uh, when we're talking about the structure of Revelation. And then for the book of Revelation itself, just a quick review. We've had chapter one. Chapter one gives the introduction, the intent, the audience, who was the intended audience, uh, the saints, uh, the context. <clears throat> then we had chapters two and three. And chapters two and three was what? It was open performance appraisal letters. Not only to the seven churches, where each church can see each other's strengths and weaknesses, but also to the universal church. Remember, he who has an ear to hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. It's a very, very important part of Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Then from there, uh, we have a then I saw, right? A textual marker. And John is taken up into um, the throne room of the Almighty God. And we see God the Father on the throne. We see the Lamb come in. We see the, the handoff of, of the, uh, the scroll given to the Lamb. We see now praise and worship given not only to the God the Father, but to God the Son as, as well. And then we start chapter 6 through 22. And 6, which we're going to look at in greater detail today. But 6 through 22, a lot of people think this is really the meat Yes, I agree, it's the action probably more than anything else. But, uh, uh, and, and it talks about things like who is the Antichrist, um, all about Satan's great tribulation, the day of the Lord, which is also the second coming of Christ, God's wrath, God's deliverance, and the transition into the eternal age. So it's all very, very important. Um, and um, from that, let's move on. Something else that I think really needs to be considered is how we interpret Revelation, because that's very, very important as well. Do we interpret Revelation literally? Or is it all allegories and symbols and symbolic? Well, it's a little bit of both, probably more literal than symbolic, but the neat thing about uh, the book of Revelation is that if there are symbols, they're usually explained and answered just a few verses down, or maybe in the very next chapter. 
Um, and so that's, um, that makes Revelation a lot more easier to us, the reader. But maybe what's more important here is that the better question to ask is, what does it mean? I'm reading this. What does it mean? What's the key message here? How does this apply to me? How does this apply to uh, my church, my family, uh, how I live my life? Those are the more important questions when we're trying to interpret what uh, the book of Revelation is saying. Another important thing is we, especially to us Americans, we need to forget the American Western perspective. Revelation is not about us, guys. Revelation focuses on Israel, God's chosen people, the Jewish nation, Jerusalem, Mount Zion, uh, the surrounding Middle East theater. It's those countries, those type of clashes. It's also important to remember in all of this is that the intended audience originally was first century church. It was their perspective. And, and so things had to make sense to them. For, and, and then we take that to help us understand what is the key message or the takeaways. And the fact that uh, keep, something else that we need to keep in mind is that scripture for the first uh, century church was what? It was Old Testament. It wasn't New Testament. Uh, that yes, there might have been some letters already started in circulation, but scripture, scripture was the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, which by the way, keep in mind, that is what Jesus said he came to do, right? He came not to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. So we need to keep that in mind. Another important thing is uh, this don't try to overcomplicate Revelation. We need to take a keep it simple approach. After all, Revelation was not written and read to the learned scholars of the day. Uh, those that were scribes uh, that uh, uh, had spent their whole lives studying the, the scripture. Revelation was written for and read to the first century common church goers. So we need to keep more of a simple approach to Revelation. Now, having said that, there are and will be mysteries being revealed in Revelation, okay? Uh, remember, we just uh, talked about last week in Daniel chapter 12, where Daniel was instructed by uh, the angel to shut up the words, to seal the book, until the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So this is something also very important, that there's a lot of mysteries that as we come closer and closer and closer to the latter days, um, God will help us understand it more. Now, he did it in a big way uh, when Jesus came down uh, and, and taught um, on end time events. The disciples themselves and their writings, the Apostle Paul and obviously uh, the Apostle John, so they're was in that time frame a huge expansion of knowledge of end time events. Also, when we're considering the interpretation, it's important to consider biblical parallels. The most important is Exodus. What happened in Exodus with God's proposal to God's uh, uh, to the children of Israel, uh, His uh, taking the children of Israel out of Egypt by sending plagues, by hardening Pharaoh's heart, uh, the Goshen principle uh, that protected the, the Hebrews out in Goshen from what was happening uh, to Pharaoh and uh, the Egyptians. And then also what happened at Mount Sinai with the betrothal um, uh, proposal and covenant and uh, rejection by Egypt. Another parallel that's also very, very important is what happened to Job. Because what happened to Job has some very important parallels in Revelation. And what happened to Job? Well, if you remember, there, there was an agreement between God and Satan 
that uh, Satan could be turned loose against Job to see if Job proved to be uh, faithful in his belief to God. And Satan was allowed to do everything but kill Job himself. Remember, he killed his family, uh, destroyed his businesses, uh, destroyed uh, all of his property, even inflicted him with, with boils. But at the end of the day, what happened? God got the glory. And Job was elevated and rewarded even more than the high position that he had in the past. So <clears throat> there's a lot of things to consider. Um, there's a lot of things happening in Revelation. It's, it's a whole set, a series of uh, complex events that are happening um, consecutively, simultaneously, um, linearly, but um, some are staggered, some are simultaneous, but all that to say is that in this complexity, there will be difference in interpretation. And some differences uh, really doesn't matter all that much. At the end of the day, God is not going to uh, reward he who has the most accurate timeline, he who nailed it, you know, you're the man because you got all the timelines in, in place. That's not what Revelation is about. And if anything, uh, I think there's a reason why timelines remain more of a mystery because we should not focus on timelines. What we need to focus on is what does it mean? What's the key messages? So we should not be dogmatic about timelines uh, and all that to say also we should not uh, come against fellow Christians because they don't believe the same timeline that we do. There will be differences in interpretation. Okay, now in the midst of all that, we talked about the textual markers where, uh, for example, uh, there will be a then I saw and then John will record something and then he'll say, then I saw something else and then he records that. And the question is, what to do with that textual block? Where does it fit in the big picture? Um, and, and here's a course that I took uh, by a... Uh, uh, Ralph Corner and in the uh, Israel uh, Bible Center. And basically what he did was he took all these textual markers and then those were blocks um, that then would, uh, he would look at it and try to figure out where it would snap into the bigger picture. Okay, so um, uh, that's just a, an example. We're not going to go through it, but it's, it's, it's a way to approach Revelation is that we take these blocks and then try to figure out if there's something else that's also happening, but maybe from a different perspective. And if so, maybe instead of falling after that, maybe it should go on top because it's the same thing happening in two different perspectives. So food for thought. Okay, now the seals. Revelation chapter 6. Jesus opening the seals, the breaking the seals off the scroll and, and basically ripping the seals away. What does it, what happens? It releases a new world order of lawlessness, of pain, of tribulation, and all this confusion and, and uh, disarray that's going on in mankind is going to result in, in two different uh, general responses. Either man is going to say, oh my God, this is God. I need to turn to God. I need to repent of my ways. I know where I'm going wrong. Um, and Lord, please forgive me. I repent. I turn to you. Or it could be a hardening of the heart, blind hatred, even acknowledging God, but hating him. And in this case, what God is going to do, he's going to cause even more spiritual blindness. Um, he's just, he's, and this is one reason why sometimes we get so frustrated that people don't see it. Well, the reason why they don't see it is maybe God has spiritually blinded them. Here's how Paul described it. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10. He says, and with all wicked deception... 
for those who are perishing, those who are not getting it. Why? Because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So what happens? Therefore, God sends them a strong disillusion. Why? So that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So this is God also sovereignly looking at everybody's hearts. And if their heart is, is no hope for ever turning to God, well, many times he'll harden that heart. And he'll bring over a veil, uh, almost a stupor, uh, that, will, uh, that makes the person incapable of even comprehending what's going on. Has this happened before? Absolutely. If we look at Exodus, uh, Exodus 7, verse 3, where God instructs Moses, he says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, so that you know any dummy would say, hey, this is God, I need to turn to him. Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then, I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. And stop and think about this. We can put this in a revelation context where those that choose to follow the Antichrist um, and in spite of all the signs and wonders that are going on, especially like ripping off of the seals, um, because they turn their hearts away from God, God is going to harden their hearts. And then what's going to happen? After all said and done, God's going to lay his hand on his people and deliver them into his kingdom. So let's read on. The seals and this is middle of the slide, seals start the process of redemption and restoration that we had already studied in Daniel, chapter 9, verse 24. Got to remember, the good news here is that God's kingdom is coming. So what's this all about? Well, as I said in Daniel 9, 24, he's going to finish transgression. He's going to put an end to sin. He's going to atone for wickedness. None of these are temporary fixes. These are all permanent fixes. He's going to bring in everlasting righteousness, righteousness that will last forever, forever, and ever. And with all this, they're going to seal up the vision and prophecy because that's it. The end is now the beginning. And he's going to anoint the most holy place, the temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, where he will sit on the throne and rule and reign. So the seals, as we see them being broken, they're going to begin with the beginning of birth pains. They're going to begin with the beginning of birth pains. Somewhere in the breaking of seals, the birth pains are going to get very intense. Um, however, uh, one thing to keep in mind what starts off bad is going to get worse and worse and more intense and more intense and more painful and more painful. Things are going to escalate very, very quick. Okay, now having said that, let's go into Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1. The first seal. <clears throat> I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, come. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bowl and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. So what all does this mean? This is the starting of God's plan being unfolded for the end of the age. And this first seal, more than any, is probably the most ambiguous of the seven seals. I mean, first and foremost, who is this conqueror? It just says, there's a conqueror. 
And he's been on conquest. Well, who is this? Well, this starts the process of God granting Satan the authority, just like what we saw in Job, uh, Satan given the authority to go after Job, but in this case, Satan is given the authority to, for what? To make war against God's elect. And that being the Jewish people and the saints. And in the case of the Jewish people, the Bible records this as Jacob's trouble. And this is going to be a very important phrase that we're going to look at in the future. Uh, because Jacob's trouble is really no mystery, no secret. God has warned the children of Israel, of the Jewish nation, for eons that this is going to happen. And he warned them why. Anyway, Revelations 13, verse 1, which is one of those parathetical chapters. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, the sea of Gentiles, with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems, uh, crowns on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. Also it was allowed to make war on who? On the saints and to conquer them as well. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. Very heavy, very heavy stuff. So what about us on our part? Well, that's recorded in Revelations 14, 12. Here's a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. So in one sense, Romans, uh, correction, Revelation 14, 12, it defines what saints are. Saints are those within the church uh, within the ecclesias, ecclesia, uh, the gathering of, of Christians, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus Christ. So this first seal begins the rise, but not the revealing of the Antichrist coming on the scene. Most likely he will be a rising figure of political and religious importance. And both of these are very important pillars when we start to consider who is the Antichrist. He's going to be a rising figure politically because he has to have political victories. He's going to be a rising picture. Uh, he's going to be a, a rising leader religiously. Why? Because this is all spiritual in the end. And Religious important is supremely important if you're going to get a following. Um, and then also, if we keep in mind what we've already discussed about the fourth kingdom and the resurrection of the fourth kingdom, which is going to be the Antichrist kingdom that we were taught in Daniel, um, and we looked at the possibility of Rome, and Rome just did not meet any of the spiritual qualifications. But then we looked at the Islamic caliphate the Ottoman Empire, and they met every scriptural requirement of being that fourth kingdom, of being that kingdom of iron and clay. And so uh, it's going to be very, very important that this leader's political and religious importance. The writer has a bow, but we're not told about any arrows. Well, in this case, the bow is more representative of a political campaign and a threat because I got a big bow. Uh, I can back my uh, words with, uh, with force if needed. It's not though a military uh, campaign, military power, it is political right now. If it was military, then it'd be represented by the sword. Now, most uh, theologians agree that this starts, this is the beginning of Daniel's 70th seven, okay? This is also the birth pains that Jesus Christ talked about, but it's not the great tribulation. The great tribulation will start later. Exactly where in the seals? Well, that's, I think I know where, but let's, let's hold off on that for now. What we will say though, is that after the seals, after the six seals, 
we have Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 7, we see this scene of these multitudes in white robes. And the, uh, one of the 24 elders asked John, says, do you know who these are? And then he answers the question. And we read that in verse 13. Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come from? And he, that being John, oh no, and, and he, that being the elder, said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So, the other thing that's important is that there's general agreement that the first seal parallels what Jesus Christ taught in the Olivet Discord in um, Matthew 24, verse 4 and 5. And I'm going to, I'm going to read this in the complete Jewish Bible. Verse 4, Yeshua replied, Watch out! Don't let anyone fool you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah. And they will lead many astray. Now, so often we read, I am the Messiah, and we look at it through our Christian perspective. The Messiah, the anointed one, chosen by God um, to, to be our Savior. Um, but stop and think about this. If the fourth kingdom was the Islamic caliphate, we have to ask the question, did they have a Messiah? And the, the answer is absolutely, the Mahdi. And if you change that then in their perspective, you could have some, a caliphate in Islam, nations, saying, I am the Mahdi, I am the Messiah and he will lead many astray. So hold that thought because we're gonna go back to it. Anyway, this first uh, horseman was given a crown. This power was not attained by his own accomplishment or his own authority, or he was not even born into royalty. Uh, it was spiritually given power and authority, ultimately by God, but also, um, uh, more pragmatically, shall we say, by Satan himself, which we will read uh, later on. So let's go to the second seal. Verse three. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. And then another horse came out, a fiery red one, and its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. Okay, to make people kill each other? Well, that's just the nature of war. It makes people kill each other. But let's unpack this. This writer not only was given a sword, but he was given a large sword. So once again, this writer is given power He's given authority. He's given equipment, military equipment. So you might say, well, how, how can that happen? Well, guess what? We just saw it happen, um, whether or not this is the Antichrist or not. We just saw this very thing happen um, in our own recent history. We saw the Taliban come into Afghanistan. And in 10 days time, they drove out the president of Afghanistan uh, they gave an ultimatum to the ISIF forces, which is mainly the U.S. military, telling them, you must leave our country or else our military, they did what? They left. They left town. And what did they not take with them? Our high-grade, highly sophisticated U.S. military weapons. The Taliban was given power to take peace away from the region. So what can we expect in all this? Um, 
We can expect to see a series of vicious Middle East military campaigns by the Antichrist. And if you recall, we just read through all that, mainly in Daniel chapter 11, verses 21 through 45. And these campaigns, these military campaigns, are going to set up the context of, of a war that's going to get more and more countries participating into this that's going to take the peace from the earth. It's very possible it's going to be another version of a world war. Paul explained this in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5.3, where he says, while people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. This is right out of Daniel, guys. I mean, we just read this in Daniel where uh, the camp, military campaigns from the Antichrist, from the little horn is what? It's going to be sudden. He's going to rise up out of nowhere and then all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. He's going to hit. He's going to hit hard. He's going to hit fast. But then Paul says this. But you, you, church in Thessalonica, you're not in darkness, brothers. For that day to surprise you like a thief? No, because what? You have God's word. You've got his prophecies. Uh, you know and understand what to look for. Um, so yes, nobody knows the day and the hour, but guess what? God has given us, his people, um, Christians, what to look out for and how to prepare. Now, do you think mainstream media and social media is going to play a role in this? <clears throat> you better believe it. They're going to do more of what they're doing now. They're going to do their utmost to support this yet to be revealed Antichrist and his campaign. I mean, I can already see the talking heads on the news shows now. You know, this guy that's risen up, uh, you know, he kind of came out of nowhere. But you know what? I think he could really bring peace to the Middle East. What do you think, Joe? Well, I think so too. I think uh, this guy has the mental capacity, the charisma, and the equipment to really get accomplished what nobody has been able to do. Um, so yes, uh, multi, uh, mainstream uh, media, social media, they're going to do their most to support this as well as cause social strife and division which they have proven to be masters of already in the world that we live in. Now, something else to keep in mind. These military attacks, they are necessary for the Antichrist to establish the abomination of desolation. Just stop and think about it. The Antichrist has to invade Jerusalem. He has to take control of Jerusalem before he can stop the daily sacrifice, before he can set himself up in the temple, uh, proclaiming himself to be worshipped. The abomination of desolation is spoken of by the prophet Daniel, as also spoken by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse. Um, and also, this whole second seal series of a of a horse coming in to take away peace. Jesus talked about that as well in Matthew 24, 6, where he says, you will hear the noise of wars nearby and the news of wars far off. See to it that you don't become frightened. Such things must happen, but the end is yet to come. For peoples will fight each other, nations will fight each other. So let's move on to the third seal. Verse five. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. I looked and there before me was a black horse and its rider was holding a, a pair of scales in his hand. And then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Let's say given instructions. Two pounds of wheat for one day for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Okay, let's unpack this. First and foremost, it's the obvious, right? As a result of the Antichrist military campaigns, 
Obviously, we're going to have major disruption in supply chains. We're going to see crops being destroyed. And the expected outcome then is going to be a massive food shortage and famine in this war-torn area because of the destroyed cops, crops, as well as hyperinflation. Okay? The holding the pair of scales in his hand, that's, that's, the scales was just that day and age is cash register. When you bought something, you went to the cashier who had scales the way out your currency, whatever that may be. Um, also, with short uh, su supplies of food, the price of food is going to go one direction only, skyrocketing. That is, if it's even can be found. Now, stop and think about this. With all this disruption in supply ch uh, chains and, and food supplies, and other supplies of essential goods and services, these shortages are critical to the Antichrist agenda because he needs to take control of the supplies requiring then his Mark of the Beast scheme in order to assume absolute control over who can and who cannot obtain food and essential goods and services. So this is going to be a ways to his mean of taking authoritarian control and persecuting the uh, Jews and the Christians. But remember there was also this instruction, do not damage the oil and the wine. Well, actually that was very common conquering practice. Uh, destroying crops, that was good because that meant hardship for, for a year and, and that way your enemy couldn't eat what they were growing. But destroying olive trees and vineyards, whoa, no. That would cause long-term devastation. And in one sense, it would negate the entire point of conquering the land because you want to conquer the land and have its existing infrastructure, be it roads or, or, or uh, olive trees or vineyards or whatnot. And then also there's something else that we need to keep in mind. And that is when Jesus Christ comes, what's he going to do? He's going to set up his throne, his kingdom for a thousand years. So the land, the surrounding land is still there. And in one sense, they want and desire to keep these olive groves, these vineyards. Um, and then also note that these horsemen, these are not the good guys. These are the bad guys. But yet we see God giving instructions to evil horsemen that they must submit to. Stop and think about it. Even Satan cannot do anything without God's approval and authority. So once again, this is God using evil to further his agenda to give him the glory. This third seal also parallels, um, once again, there's a parallel in, in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, verse 7, where Jesus Christ says, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various parts of the world. All this is but the beginning of the birth pains. So we're still in birth pains. And we're still in the beginning of birth pains. But then comes the fourth seal. So let's read it. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. <clears throat> I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death. And Hades was following close behind him. They, being death and Hades, were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, by famine, by plague, and by wild beasts of the earth. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. These writers were given, once again, they're given power to kill a specific target that entails over a fourth of the earth. This is huge, guys. But what is this fourth of the earth? Is it geographical? Is it a, 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 a defined geopolitical boundary? 
Or is it a population, a quarter of the Earth's people? Or is it, you know, an ethnic group? These groups among all the peoples of the world. Uh, or is it all the above or both? Well, here's some facts to consider. About 25% of the world's population are what I would call true Christians. Okay, well, that's the Christians. What about the Jews? We already got 25%. Well, the Jewish nations, the Jewish people, they comprise about 0.2% of the world's population. That's all there is in the world of the Jews. So, um, all that to say is that there's a strong indication, um, I would say a very strong indication, that this power over a fourth of the earth to kill them by sword, famine, plague, or wild beasts is targeted against the Jewish people and the Christians. After all, we stop, stop and remember, what, especially what we talked about in Daniel. What is it that motivates uh, the Antichrist, that motivates Satan? It's not, it's not uh, greed, it's not power, it's not wealth. It is a hatred of the Abrahamic covenant, a hatred of God's chosen people, a hatred of God's chosen land. That is what motivates um, Satan, and that's what will motivate uh, the Antichrist. So if we use scripture to interpret scripture, this fourth is the Christians and the Jews of the world. We're given as God sovereignly directing and allowing his people to be tested, his people to be refined in keeping with his purpose of redemption and giving him the glory and preparing a bride for the lamb. Now, in the case of the non-Messianic Jews, this is something that had been told time and time again to expect. Okay, uh, remember Jacob's trouble. We still have not yet gotten into it, but here's just a tidbit out of Ezekiel 14, verse 21. For thus says the Lord God, Yahweh God, how much more when I sin, I, God, sin upon Jerusalem, my four disastrous acts of judgment, sword, famine, wild beasts, and pestilence to cut up, to cut off from it man and beasts. The Jewish people have been warned and forewarned time and time again. So the consequences of this intentional targeted persecution, because that's what it's going to be, it's going to be persecution dialed up to horrific proportions. It's not only going to entail physical death, which is death on the horse, but also there is the threat of spiritual death, which is much, much more important to avoid. That being Hades, the holding place, uh, uh, that uh, people are destined for hell. For anyone who denounces Jesus Christ, that is the second death that you want to avoid at all costs. Now, how do the saints have the victory in all this? Well, there's only one way. And that's told in Revelation 12, 11. And they have conquered him. Who's him? That's Satan. That's Antichrist. How? By the blood of the lamb. That's the only way that Antichrist can be conquered. By the blood of the lamb. And if you want to be a real threat to Satan and the Antichrist, by the word of their testimony. And then if you want to really have the victory, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Stop and think about it. If we put ourselves in the proper perspective, in the eternal perspective, we're just passing through whatever we have in terms of material possessions or even you know, our, our flesh and blood. That's temporary, guys. That's temporary. We're not home yet. Home is God's kingdom. So if, if we have a choice that we have to make that's going to be life or death, Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus Christ or following the Antichrist and taking the mark of the beast, it's a no-brainer. It should be a no-brainer because there's victory in death. 
And death and Hades, in this case, they're evil powers once again. These are not the good guys. These are the evil guys. They're being used by God for his purposes, to give himself the glory, to refine his people, his church, his called people, uh, the Jewish people. And that in the end, death and Hades, they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. So that tells us very right up front, these are not good angels. These are evil angels. Revelations 20, verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. So there's death and Hades. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they have done. Okay, so that's the people that, have been, uh, that are part of the second resurrection. But then read verse 14. Then death and Hades, they themselves were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire that we want to avoid at all costs. Okay, but there's another mystery here. How in the world is the pale horse rider of death and Hades falling close behind and being used by the Antichrist and Satan, how in the world are they going to instruct wild peace, correction, wild beast of the earth to kill a quarter of the people? Those that are Jews, those that are Christians, how in the world are you going to instruct a wild beast to say you can go after him and him and her, but not those people or those people? It's a mystery, right? Not really. Once again, remember what we talked about at the very beginning of this course, that what is important, what is inerrant in God's word is the original text in the original language. And if for some reason in our English versions it's just not making sense or there's contradictions, then we need to take it, drill it down to the original text in the original language. So if we drill this down into the original language, we'll see that the New Testament Greek word for beast is therion. Therion means, and, and before I even get there, in the original text, there is no adjective. There is no wild. So it's, it's, it's not only beast, but wild beast. Well, there is no wild. That is an interpretation of translation. Okay. Now let's look at Therion. Therion can mean beast. It can mean wild animal. It can also mean a brute. It can also mean a brutish man. It's all the same word. Therion. And if we take a look then at the New Testament usage of Therion, we'll, know, we'll note that about three quarters of the word is found only in Revelation. There's very, very little outside of Revelation. So that's what we need to do then is for Scripture to uh, interpret Scripture is first and foremost, we have to look at Therion in the same book that we found it in that we're struggling with interpretation. So we go to Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. And when they had finished their testimony, the beast, the Therion, that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them, and kill them. Well, who's the theory on here? It's not wild beasts. That's the Antichrist. Huh. Chapter 13, verse 1. And I saw a theory on rising out of the sea, a beast rising out of the sea, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the theory on. They're not following a wild animal. They're following, following the Antichrist. And they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, to the Therion. And they worshiped who? The beast, the Therion, saying, who is like the, the beast? And who can fight against it? So you see, wild beasts, it's just a wrong translation. It's a bad translation. Verse 11, then I saw another beast rising out of the earth, and it exercised all authority of the first beast in its presence, and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Verse 17, so that no one could buy and sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the wild animal. 
No, that's not what the scripture says. So that the name of the beast, the antichrist, the therion, or the number of its name. And this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. What? For it is the number of, it doesn't say wild animal, for it's the number of a man. And his number is 666. So you see the beast in Revelation chapter 6 in the fourth seal should be read as not the wild beast, plural, but let's go to the original language, the beast of the earth. And then probably the most important verse in all this is Revelation 14 verse 9. If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, once again, remember beast here is Therion, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever and they will have no rest day or night these worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. Okay, so if we use scripture to interpret scripture and we take Revelation 6 and verse 8, where they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, plague, or by Therion of the earth. And then we also then look at Revelation 14, 9, and if anybody worships the beast, what is it that's going to happen? They're going to die not only physically, but they're going to die spiritually. They will be overtaken by Hades. They will suffer the wrath of God um, because they will be part of the second re uh, resurrection. So having said all that, I think we can safely say that while peace of the earth really should read, and by the beast of the earth. So let's move on. The fourth seal, therefore, when we put it in all this context, it really represents a choice. That's what it all boils down to. A choice that many people must make. And the choice is either to follow the Antichrist. If I follow the Antichrist, then I'll get food in my belly. Uh, I will get acceptance by society. Uh, and and uh, it won't be off with my head. But if I choose to follow Christ, then chances are, if I'm lucky, I wouldn't even call that lucky, but one option might be I'll be thrown in prison or I'll be forced to starve. Um, I'll die either by sword, by famine, by plague, or by the Antichrist himself. We got to remember, we got to be prepared. And for me, my answer that I've already worked out in my mind, in my heart, in my soul, is I choose to follow God rather than man. The fourth seal parallels, there's a parallel there also in, in Jesus' Olivet Discourse. In Matthew 24, 9, at that time, that time be what we're just talking about, Revelation 6, 7, and 8, you will be arrested and handed over to be punished and put to death. And all peoples will hate you because of me. At that time, many will be trapped into betraying and hating each other. Now, is everybody going to be pulled, put to death? No, that's not what Scripture says. Uh, in fact, in Scripture, I think it's in Revelation chapter 13, where it says, into, if you're destined for captivity, into captivity you will go. If you're destined for the sword, by the sword you will be slain. Um, and I would say, most likely, ground zero in all this is going to be in the Middle East, in those countries that the Antichrist has physically taken over um, politically and militarily. So, that's the first 
four seals. So, that, so just kind of just to refresh our minds. The first four seals, or the first four horsemen, uh, they're sequential. And they give a story. A story of somebody rising up, a story of deceit, of rising political power and conquest. That'll be the first horseman. And uh, his rising political power will probably be religious power too. It's very probable he'll proclaim himself as the Mahdi, the Messiah of the Islamic world. Um, this is going to be followed by military bloodshed, the second horseman. So it'll be a massive, violent, and quick military campaign, just mowing over smaller nations. This is going to result in economic destabilization and famine. That's just the third horseman. And then widespread persecution and death. That will be the fourth horseman. But remember, death has two flavors. There's a physical death and there's a spiritual death. So that's something that really needs to keep in mind because it is death being followed by Hades. In this, God not only defeats the power of evil, but he uses the power of evil as agents of his own victory. That is the sovereignty and the omnipotence of our almighty God. So the events of the first four seals, it's the result ultimately of humans by means of Satan controlling the Antichrist being unrestrained in their sin. And these humans are doing evil things to a, a specific group of humans. So it's man against man. Uh, can man even be this evil? Well, the answer is a resounding yes. Has precedent been set? Absolutely. Compare this to the evil of the days of Noah, where God got so angry he was going to destroy mankind, but save Noah and his sons, his family, and the animals. Compared to Solomon and Gomorrah, where their evil rose to such a level that God said, if there's even 10 righteous men in Sodom and Gomorrah, I will spare them. And there wasn't. So, also the first four seals is God sovereignly allowing man to express all the evil they're capable of doing. I think we can see that. And these disasters that we are seeing in the four horsemen, well, to be honest, there's really nothing new here. These disasters are as old as the human race itself. It's nothing more than a history of sin repeating itself. Um, man going against man and the consequences of that. Also, as we have been told time and time again in the Old Testament, this is God's way of using conquering nations as a wake-up call to his people, as a wake-up call to the world to say, wake up, you're not following me. You're not giving me the glory and honor and praise that I deserve. And because you're turning your back on me, I'm going to send the Babylonians. I'm going to send the Chaldeans. I'm going to send the Romans as a wake-up call. And some, this is something that the Western world, the Western church, we're really insulated from. We don't understand persecution. We don't understand how devastating famines and pestilence and war and persecution can be, which, oh, by the way, has happened historically time and time again in the Middle East. We're so blessed to be where we are. And I am so saddened and extremely concerned that we, as a Western nation, we as Europe, we as the United States are now calling evil good and good evil. We're being set up to really be shaken and judge. However, everything after the force seal is not going to be man against man. It's going to be God doing things via forces of nature, uh, cosmic events, uh, spiritual powers against, used against unbelievers. And keep in mind that um, his chosen people that have not accepted Yeshua as their Messiah, they're unbelievers. They're currently unbelievers and will be treated 
as under believers, even though there's going to be a remnant that's going to be saved, which we read just recently in Zechariah chapters 12, 13, and 14, that two thirds will perish and one third will remain. But his purpose of such judgments is to bring people to see the error of their ways, to repent and turn to God who will receive them with open arms. God always has an open door back to him uh, in his chastisements. Um, the time will come where it'll be no longer chastisements, but it'll be God's wrath. But that is yet to come. So uh, we'll stop here and take up with part two uh, in just a minute.